Cooperative Legacy Project interview number 27, February 23rd, 2006. We're visiting with Owen Jones, cooperative activist and alternative fuel supporter. Owen, where and when were you born? I was born in Lowell, Lowell Township, um, Spain, South Dakota, uh, September 22nd of 37. Okay. And uh, where was your family originally from before the Joneses came to South Dakota? Where were they from? Our ancestors um, on my dad's side were from Wales. Okay. Okay. And you have brothers. And, uh, did you have a sister at all? No. Nope, okay, just brothers. There were four sons. Okay. Yeah in the family. Okay, and what were their names? Morris was the oldest, is the old, oldest one, and then Curtis, and then myself, and then a brother, Leon, that is, is passed away. Okay, okay. Um, what are some of the early memories you have? You grew up out on the farm or ranch. You had cattle always, I presume. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've had cattle. Uh, uh, Used to uh, feed lots and lots of lambs, and and uh, always had some sheep around, and and uh, of course growing up, why you always had had chicken chores to do, and and gather eggs, and and raising a few ducks here and there, and some geese and some turkeys to to get enough food to put on the t table. Mm -hmm. A lot more diversified operations than people tend to have today. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, your father was Art Jones. Uh, he was one of the first two inductees into the South Dakota Co-op Hall of Fame. Uh, when did he first become involved in the cooperative movement? You uh, would you be able to answer that question? I, I Chuck, uh, uh, Chuck, I I really can't answer that. I can share with you that that um, the very first memory I would have of, um, of the word cooperative or farmers union was when I was really early in the grades and, and going with, um, with my, my folks out to Birch Hall west of Britain to farmers union local meetings and doing all the stuff that, that, that those active locals used to do, whether it be from playing cards to singing to, to uh, all of the other things that were involved in those early days of, of, uh, of the, the cooperative movement. Mm -hmm. And I guess that really was, was my first uh, um, exposure that I recall okay. to cooperative mm -hmm. movements. Uh he was very active in the rural electric movement. Uh, I think uh, uh, everybody I've talked to in the rural electrics has mentioned him as somebody that they that they thought a lot of. Uh, was he was he involved in the original organizing of the Northern Electric up here? No, he was he was not. He was originally uh, they they. Uh, I'm sure that he was one of a, a handful uh, along, uh, well, like with Merle Mackley and, and a guy by the name of Clarence Gronseth. And I'm not sure who else w were involved in our area, but, but no, they did go, go, uh, go around from house to house or farm to farm uh, trying to get um, uh, initial funds, whether, well, I'm not sure what it was, if it was five or ten bucks a piece, um, to get electricity going, but it was with Lake Region Electric Cooperative oh, Lake Region. Okay. at yeah. Webster. Lake Region. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Is where he originally started in the REA sure. movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that would have been around here. What time frame would that have been? The 40s sometime? It would have been the. the um, Early 40s, well, you know, Chuck, I'm, re I'm really not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. They may have started just prior to, to World War II, but, but uh, the real action, of course, didn't start until after the war. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that, uh, I should know this for sure, but I don't, I think that, that our first electricity was probably in about 
1940, well, 45 to 47 range, I think in that 45 range, but but mm -hmm. somewhere in that mm -hmm. area. That was probably getting close to about average for eastern south. Dakota. I would guess that's probably right. Yeah, yeah. Did he ever comment much on what he liked about cooperatives and what it caused him to be involved? And uh, certainly probably the concept of whether or not uh, electricity would have ever been provided out here by any other means but cooperatives. Well, Chuck. First off, um, um, let's let's uh, talk about electricity. Uh, um, I think that 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 um, it was so important to the fu to the future of the farm that we get electricity. That 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 he um, he really wanted to make life easier and more productive. On or in rural America, and and this was one of the ways that he seen that that um, uh, would be of the most benefit at that point in time. Now I don't know if that if you want to rephrase the question again, why? Um, and I, I would assume that for him it was a natural progression to kind of uh, look on to once you you had a local. Um, rural electric cooperative established and then to worry about where the power was going to come from in terms of East River or Basin Electric uh, to be involved in getting that um, determined whether mm -hmm. it was uh, from the hydroelectric dams or from later on from coal fired plants. Well, uh, uh, once they got their 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 local uh, uh, co-ops together, I mean, by local their local electric co-ops together, mm -hmm. why, why, yeah, of course. Then the next next real challenge was to try to find a supplier for them, and of course, uh, when the dams came online, that certainly did help. But but uh, it didn't take. Um, these farmers very long to realize that they needed to to look a lot further out and and, and to try to plan some sort of a generation system that they could control rather than fight the utilities and they did fight the utilities mm -hmm. and so I'm sure that that was a was one of their prime concerns about about securing a, 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 a generation system. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of the people that he worked with in those days that uh, uh, at which that impressed you? Uh, oh, that, that yeah, that, that your dad worked with in the rural electric movement. Well, um, I guess that that um, I got to think about that just a little bit here. I think that that. Uh, uh, one of the first ones I ever had any contact with, you know, uh, Hildy Wilson was the uh, the manager at at Lake Region, and, and and I guess that was one of my er, my er, my early on impressions, but but uh, good impressions. But there has been any number of them, of course, and 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 uh, um, well. Now, whether it be Ken Holm or Ralph Herseth or or uh, people along those lines, and of course later on, why why Jim Grawl was uh, uh, extremely uh, well, I I thought he he did did a fantastic job for us, and 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 really was. Uh, was impressed with him, and and there's a number of other ones, whether it be um, Bob Ferguson or 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 some of those types of people. Mm -hmm. And he also served in the legislature for a while. Um, and that would, would that have been in the fifties and sixties, or that that would have been uh, in that time frame. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He served there for almost twenty years, I think. Mm. Okay. Did, did he have any particular pet issues that he was concerned with in the legislature that kept him going that long? Or was defensive rural electrics, I suppose, was something? Well, um, yes, and they, they, needless to say, they had many fights 
on that front. Yeah, the defense of rural electrics, that's exactly right. But no, I just think that that um, he just felt um, a true responsibility to uh, to uh, try to, to uh, do his little thing that uh, that might make this place a little bit better for his sons and and grandkids. So mm-hmm. so uh, uh, he was was uh, one time I think he that he was one term he was majority leader of the state's senate and mm-hmm. and a number of times minority. Of course, the Democrats were always in the minority most of the time. Yeah, nothing new there. Yeah. Um, what was your mother's name? Wilma. Wilma, okay. You want to talk about her a little bit? Well, she uh, she was pretty um, organized individual and was 150% behind her husband and did a lot of work so that my dad could be gone as much as he was mm-hmm. and and uh she uh, that could sometimes be a difficult thing for families oh yeah some people oh sure people were yep. gone a lot and yep. uh, it doesn't always go easily no no that's right but uh she really did did exceptionally well she always uh um well, always was there for as a as a mother, but still she was always there as a hired hired person, almost you, you know, r- helping run the show and 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 making sure that the hired men knew what they were doing and and when when it was tr- was mm-hmm. time after school, why we each had our our chores, of course, that we had to do, and and that's the way that that we that she made things. Flow. She probably, um, well, I'm not sure how to, uh, uh, a really a, a godly person, I think, mm-hmm. is probably the best way I can put it. Uh, when you were young, did you, did you always want to farm? Yeah, I think I did, uh, because it, it, um, um, I always was, uh, Always had some livestock around uh, mm-hmm. that, that I called my own or, or something, and and no, I uh, uh, don't think there was ever anything else really in my mind ex- except the farm. Okay. And uh, life on the farm or ranch, we we talked about the diversification issue, but it was quite a bit different back in 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 the uh, late forties and uh, in the forties and fifties than it is today. Well, of course, that's it. That's right, Chuck. And, and um, I don't know. Uh, um, I'm not sure how to ex- ex- <laughs> expand on yeah. Yeah. that one. I think I think that 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 uh, as a kid, we weren't near. It, even though we had a lot of work to do, we uh, we we. Uh, did most of that at home, and most of our entertaining was found in di- in different ways at home. Today, our young people have to have to travel and travel, and and are busy all the time, and uh, and uh, so that's one of the major differences I would I would see. Uh, plus the fact that that uh, uh, growing up out on the or in rural America, you just uh, just are so fortunate that you have a, a different pers- perspective. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. you're close to to God or to Mother n- Nature. And mm-hmm. where did you go to school? Was there a country school out here? Yeah, uh, just uh, well, Wa- Waverly Township, number two. It mm-hmm. it was about eighty rods from our home farm. Okay. Is where I went to grade school, and then uh, went to uh, graduate high school um, at Britain. Okay, and that would have been what about 1955. That's right, 1955. Okay. Um, did you uh, serve in the military at all? I was in the na- the National South Dakota National Guard Force. Okay. Okay, and that, uh, of course, six involved, years. Six years, and that didn't involve any deployments anywhere no, outside the country. No, 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 it, 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 it did not, and um, um, 
spell and won't go there. Okay. Uh, and then the, uh, college. Did you go to college? Didn't or? didn't okay. go to college. You didn't get motivated in that no. regard. No. Okay. When did you meet? Or where did you meet your wife at? Or when? Um. About, what's her, and what's her name? Uh, Barbara was her name, mm -hmm. but she is now deceased. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, met her in 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 Britain in about 1959, I guess. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. And you have kids. You want yep. to talk about them a little bit? I've got a daughter that uh, um, is uh, an RN and and uh, uh, lives in Egan, Minnesota, and uh, uh, have she has uh, three children. We've got a granddaughter, twenty. Four that uh, is getting married March 11th, and uh, then I've got two grandsons there, and and then I've got a son that that is close by here, that's in the livestock trucking business, and he uh, he has a son and a daughter, and so I've got five grandkids. Okay, keep you a little bit busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. How did you get involved in cooperatives? Uh, what was the what, what was the first was it service on the board here at the you know, at Marshall County Farmers Union? Uh, my first first involvement actually in co-op uh, in co-ops was um, uh, to run for the board of our local farm supply cooperative, Farmers Union Oil Company at yep. Britain, and uh, consequently, or I did get beat my first first time out. So. Um, um, but the next time I ran, I I did uh, get on the board and and uh, served in that capacity uh, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I think that that Chuck the re the the real one of the real reasons that I got involved on on that co-op board was that I seen it. Uh, as an opportunity to to uh, give a little bit of, of of something back and 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 uh, it would be closer to home and and wouldn't involve a whole lot of uh, work I didn't think but it mm -hmm. it did turn out to be a little <laughs> bit yeah, yeah. different than that and one of the the reasons um, I I uh, was extremely interested in, in our far or had been for years, Farm Supply Cooperative was at one time there was a employee by the name of Clayton Bussey that uh, really, really impressed me with his ability to, to uh, tell people what the co-op was about as you came in the door. And Clayton uh, always whenever I came in the door he would say something about the fact if you just remember what you spend here while you're probably going to get a little bit back sometime down the line and those types of comments and that was impressive to me at, at that particular time do you remember when it was that you were first elected to that board um chuck i really don't know yeah. uh, uh it's going to be uh, uh i think i think that that it was probably uh, about 19 1976 in that range, I think. Okay. okay. What were the uh, what were some of the main issues that you had to deal with with a cooperative at that time? Of course, we were getting into the time period when the when the local cooperatives were facing some different issues than maybe they had faced earlier on. Uh, for example, the the uh, the supply situation. Uh, as far as uh, petroleum um, with, with embargoes and those kinds mm -hmm. of things going on? Well, um, there was, I really am not sure um, if I can recall anything particularly about uh, um, very much shortage of products at the time. I know that, that, that uh, uh, we were were scurrying to make sure that 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 we were going to be able to find stuff, but uh, I, I'm not sure that 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 was not was n not really a very long lasting situation for us, mm -hmm. and 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 I think that that um, 
uh, one of my my um, early on concerns was the the inability of our regional to um, to um, well, we were in the into hardware and home appliances and stuff, and we weren't getting, in my mind, we weren't getting the commitment that we needed out of staff uh, uh, from our regional, and we spent a lot of tr time trying to to um, to change that. Um, that was one of the first things I recall. Uh, we didn't we really didn't get that. Uh, Accomplished, but but um, I don't. Um, Try to think. I don't know uh, what else would be. Uh, we were really fortunate that 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 we had really good management uh, those years that that I was just getting on the board uh, or getting. My feet wet. Uh, Ken Stilson was a manager and 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 was really quite effective. And and uh, had supper with him last night. Oh, him oh, is that right? Okay, okay. And and uh, <clears throat> so he he uh, he made things uh, uh, pretty easy, at least for me. I thought while I was getting my feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, you were certainly involved during the period of time when there's, in the case of, of this co-op, uh, there was a lot of, there was some expansion going on, and uh, there were, at the time when there was some mergers, do you want to talk a little bit about that process? Uh, it's, it's kind of still ongoing, I think. Yes, but, uh, yes. Well, um, I think uh, early on, um, we realized as as we can as this nation continued to go on the path of a cheap food policy of of how much of a burden it puts on farmers to try to try to to maintain a pro, uh, a profitable edge and and um, stay in business but consequently we have we each year we would continue to lose lots and lots of producers and so that in itself was was the changing times and 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 we as a co-op how are we, we going to remain strong and viable and all of the other uh, cliches um, and ho hopefully be able to continue to retire equity on a timely basis how are we going to uh, do that as our patron base erodes and so one of the ways that that we uh, we thought we could do it was by expanding our area and 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 uh, we um, I can say that this co-op has has uh, done lots and lots or the directors over the years have spent lots and lots of time um, in in sessions um, talking about things that that we can do to uh, to tr try to position ourselves for the future and I think oh, overall they that uh, uh, that they they've done a relatively good job you know these merger things aren't always very easy they're really extremely difficult to do and you you hurt a lot of feelings and and if people don't take time to sit back and really understand what the co-op and the board is trying to do is to protect their investment the best the best way they can why uh, it's it it can be a sore spot with a lot of people and 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 uh, when you go in to close a, a non profitable section of the system uh, uh, why you get lots of negative feedback and you sometimes have trouble holding patrons so mm -hmm. does it does it make a difference whether the whether you had a, a co-op that, uh, that 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 made the decision to to merge with with Britain without uh, without being in severe economic trouble necessarily as opposed to say a situation like over at Columbia where I think they they, they uh, were in mm -hmm. pretty significant safe uh, well yes it's 
it's always easier if you um, if you have a, re a a relatively strong balance sheet when you go into a to a merger discussion, mm -hmm. and 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 um, um, in fact, um, uh, it's it's extremely important that you do that because then you've got some some bargaining power as or about uh, how you would like to see things work if it's if if it's a little bit different than what you'd like and 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 so uh, I think that that um, having said that it may be more difficult to close like a service bay in an area that has been, has been profitable in the past except this one segment segment hasn't been and they people a lot of people um, expect that that we need to subsidize to that portion and and I um, to to provide that service and to a certain degree I can understand that but the fact of the matter is that you have to remain uh, you have to maintain a pretty good balance sheet or your or your co-op is not going to be here you can provide this services as long as there's a a a real need but but the real need shows on the bottom line also so is there a, is there a difficulty and i think you kind of address this but is there a difficulty in maintaining loyalty when you the bigger you get the do the folks out on the fringes feel like the, the local input is still there or uh, well, or no. Can you address that from no. where you're sitting at, close in the air? Chuck, I think that 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 any time you grow, uh, loyalty is a little harder to man, to maintain. Mm -hmm. But in today's agriculture, loyalty is very uh, not very important to most people. It's the bottom line, and if you're not cost effective. Why uh, loyalty uh, in except in a few extreme cases, loyalty is not very important to most people. It's and 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 that's a little bit difficult for for guys as old as I am to understand. But nonetheless, that is the way it is. And so, anytime you grow it, you're going to it's going to be more uh, difficult to to. Uh, to maintain loyalty. That's why the most one of the most important things in a in a system that's growing all the time is you have to consistently work on your communication skills. And let people know what's going on and 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 keep them informed. And that really is one of the more important things, I think. Okay. Um. Let's go to a, a, a somewhat different issue here now. Let's talk about uh, renewable fuels and in particular ethanol. When did you first get inter interested in ethanol as, a, as an alternative fuel that could help farmers? Um, we talked about the oil embargo under the Carter administration, Chuck. That's when I became interested in alternative fuels. That's when I knew that we, we had to do something different than what we were doing and uh, um, I uh, can remember being with Dr. Paul Medall and and uh, Virgil Fondness and a few more uh, Dr. Medall was from South Dakota State and Virgil was was chairman of East River at the time and and attending some some uh, deals at Brookings and and uh, uh, some of my uh, neighbors such as Harold Olson and Leonard Zilke, and by the way, Leonard's dad was one of the founders of the Birch Farmers Union mm -hmm. local. Uh, anyway, uh, we sp we spent uh, a number of days dri uh, driving the country looking at at these home stills that that were the the, the get of the the ethanol. 
business then. And, and of course, needless this, the history is there, but needless to say, a number of them we looked at had ran for a little bit and then were just quit because they were so difficult to make work if they worked at all. But that's, Chuck, to answer your question, that's when I really became interested in renewable fuels. And uh, how long after that was it that, that the American Coalition for Ethanol, or ACE, got started? Um, you know, Chuck, I'm not sure I've got the actual date on that. I will, I will try to, 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 to get it for, for you. Um, yeah. you know, a, a general time frame um, within you know a few years or let me let me check here okay Today it's the it's 06, 06 and and uh, I think we're we're going to have our nineteenth uh, annual meeting, Chuck. So if you can sub okay. subtract, uh, that's twenty All right. years ago. About nineteen eighty six is when okay. when it was started, and it was it was the founder was Merle Anderson mm -hmm. from Climax, Minnesota, who was a really Strong, strong um, uh, rural electric guy, okay. and 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 he was the er, the original founder. And I didn't uh, become involved with him until uh, um, maybe it was two years after they they organized. Okay. One of the uh, early issues uh, here in South Dakota, of course, was going back earlier than that, was establishing the the tax break at the pump for ethanol blend fuels, which I think was originally four cents, wasn't it? Yes, that's and right. And then it went to two later yep. on when, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when, the, when some of that money was retargeted yep. toward helping ethanol yep. plants that were in state. Uh, you want to talk about that process at all? or uh, uh, There's kind of been a continual struggle. There are not everybody in South Dakota who has always been supportive of the idea of, of ethanol. That's right, Chuck. Well, uh, to be right up front uh, on that, um, about the only thing I can say is that we're fortunate the ethanol industry is really fortunate that, that we had people such as Ori Swayze from Wilmot, Scott Parsley, who was with East River Electric, and and a few more that uh, that really helped push that four cent tax incentive through, and and I'm sure that that um, um, that Representative uh, Dashell at that time had his influence on the state senate or uh, uh, legislative process as well. And as far as helping to get that tax in place, tax incentive in place, and and which was really an excellent, excellent thing to do. Yeah, that seems as I remember that was one of his early issues that he really worked yeah. on from, yeah. from the first moment he got elected. Yeah, to, that's right. To office in 1978. Um, was there a back, was there a crucial time here in South Dakota? We've got a lot of ethanol plants in the state now, but was there a crucial time where things broke in favor of of, of, of in-state production as opposed to uh, uh, when things could have gone bad? For example, of taking the incentives away when they were needed? Well, um, I think, Chuck, that, that the... Um, the tax incentive, and then the plant production incentive. The mm -hmm. the um, the I forget what the amount was, but but 
but the guarantee that they were going to get so much per year, uh, that really played an important, well, that's probably one of the most important steps as far as getting Bruins interested in, in proceeding with their, their, uh, their toy at, at Scotland, which has turned into, to, well, um, well, I'm stumbling four words because I, I I can't find it. But 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 the 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 Scotland plant is what has helped start the ethanol industry nationwide. And now I'm not not praising Bruins all that much, but nonetheless they um, their their ability to make an uh, outdated plant run why it was really important to the industry overall. Yeah, I, I remember uh, struggle over uh, uh, at a time when there wasn't any production in South Dakota and people were saying, well, why should there be a tax break because it's going to somebody outside of the state? Yeah. And then, of course, yeah. finally mm -hmm. reaching the point where we are now, it's difficult for somebody to come forward well, and oppose it yeah. all yeah. because it's yeah. so important to the mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. um, As you look at uh, ethanol development in South Dakota, what do you think are the, the, the most important achievements that have been accomplished in South Dakota? The most important yeah. achieve, uh, achievements that have been accomplished in yeah. South Dakota? Yeah. In relation to ethanol development. I, uh, um, I want to answer that this way now. There's a whole, there are, a, uh, I'm sure, uh, extended list of things that that um, I could address but I firmly believe that the most important accomplishment in the in the ethanol industry today in South Dakota and nationwide is has taken place right at Four Seasons Cooperative in Britain South Dakota we now have the ability I can go to a pump and I have five choices of fuel, five choices, and I can get that five choices out of one hose and by just punching whatever one I want to punch. Today, the American consumer has the ability to decide what he or she would like to burn in their vehicle. And, and I really believe that, that with the with the good again, with the good help of Ori Swayze and a few more, this blender pump for ethanol in our local Senate station today is the first one in the nation, as far as we know, that is being used for a blender pump for ethanol. And that is going to well, I really believe it will change the ethanol industry. Now we've got a real challenge ahead of us as far as letting people know uh, that those things are out there and why they should make their own choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I really think that's, that's uh, to date, that's the most important thing. Now there's, there's uh, uh, without the RFS, the Renewable Fuels Bill legislation mm -hmm. and all of that, um, that all plays a part, but but um, and of course you know the the um, the cost of energy overall has been makes the ethanol industry uh, really viable more so now and and uh, now to have President Bush come out and at least be talking about it, I am extremely concerned that it's that it's just talk, but nonetheless talking about uh, about it from a leadership level has been extremely important. It, it's, it's added uh, a lot of interest in, re, in renewal fuels, as, as it should. So, mm -hmm. What do you make of the, uh, of the idea of switching to making ethanol out of switchgrass or something like that uh, when the existing plants are based on corn production? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a ways off, I presume. You know, I'm, like Chuck, I'm... Sure, it is a ways off, but just let me share with you that that, and without trying to, well, I won't go there. Uh, um, I th I think that it was it was twelve years ago 
that that uh, there was an AP board or reporter, a young reporter that that uh, was sitting right where you're sitting, and he uh, he had heard that that I was one of the uh, prime movers in trying to get a a hundred thousand uh, dollar grant from the Department of Energy to study cellulistic ethanol for production. And, and uh, uh, consequently, uh, uh, that story came out. Um, some farmer in South Dakota wants to turn weeds into ethanol. And, and uh, it, was, uh, it was, must have been a slow news day for a f few days because it, or Paul Harvey picked it up and was, was can, couldn't imagine that the government would, would spend money like that. And uh, Charlie Osgood also <laughs> had it on his program. So anyway, did he have uh, a poem about it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how it was, but anyway, uh, uh, that the idea has been around a long time. We did we did secure that hundred thousand dollar grant and 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 did some work with it. Uh, we have. Um, South Dakota State uh, has had a project up on some of our switchgrass ground for a number of years, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, studying production rates and so forth of how much could be produced an acre. So there's there has been a lot of work done prior to the time that President Bush suggested that we start using switchgrass for ethanol. Mm -hmm. So it's not a new idea. It's been around for a long, yeah. long time. Yeah. Probably and, from about the beginning, I would yeah, guess. There was yeah. talk of all kinds of yeah. things being, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, product, being uh, yeah. something that could be yeah. used to produce. And, and, and I think long term that, that, that you will see that uh, a large majority of the renewable fuels will be made from cellulistic stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, What are the, that obviously is a challenge out there to continue the expansion. What do you see as the challenges facing the ethanol industry today besides that? Uh, uh, well, um, n number one, I think, is getting people to to accept it, and that that can or that is the total thing. Now, there's different concerns in there. So for example, before the before the Minnesota uh, mandate can come into play, EPA has to uh, approve a higher blend for auto engines, for example. And so there's all sorts of those things that need to be done to help it along. We, a lot of us think that, that, um, that um, as much ethanol blending that's going on in the country today, for example, I use, well, now I use 30%, but up until then, I pulled up to a E85 pump and I, tr I tried to run 45% in my non-flex fuel vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of that going on, and we know it's not, it's not going to hurt the engines, and we, we think that, or at ACE at least, we've done enough work that we, uh, we think that it's a lot better for the environment. And then, then E10 or, or um, um, well, or E10 mm -hmm. or non-leaded gasoline. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the uh, EPA standards do they address anything about the twenty percent, or do they? Where do they? Do, where do they draw the line? Well, uh, uh, the do they? the as far well. As far as automobile companies' warranties on regular vehicles, do they? Uh, are they uh... no, they will. The warranty will stand up if it's ten percent. But, okay. for example, in, in in my car when it was under warranty yet, if they would have known, if I would have had something go wrong, and they would have have suspected it was from running thirty percent ethanol in it, why my warranty would have been void. So the, the quest, answer is that that they warranty 10% but nothing else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And by that I mean that that yeah. that that um, yeah. if they. And of course, originally they weren't doing anything. No, that's right. Uh, way back, yeah. and they were mm -hmm. spreading stories yeah. about it uh, ruining engines yeah. and all yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, many of the uh, of the ethanol plants in South Dakota uh, were originally organized as cooperatives, and they've since shifted to LLCs. Uh, why did that happen, and uh, and what's your view on on that? Uh, I, I think some of the LLCs tend to still operate kind of like cooperatives, even though they've changed their structure a bit. Well, Chuck, I'm not going to be able to expand on that okay. very much. I think I, I think that it really was more or less of a of a a business um, ease of business and to help do some tax things that were a little. It, Easier to handle that way. They're they're still really handled similarly to cooperatives, mm -hmm. um, but there's going to be a real challenge in the future to keep these farmer-owned, invested ethanol-producing facilities in the hands of farmers. There's going to be a real need out there to to make sure that those those. Uh, Plants that are owned by farmers that uh, that the, the people on those boards and and the stockholders to uh, keep abreast of what's going on and and make sure that their plant is is on top of everything because our track record as far as cooperatives uh, we all we got to do is go back and look at some uh, some history and realize that. Involvement is absolutely the key, and you've got to have directors that have open minds and will challenge management. And if you don't have, your cooperative isn't going to last. And, and I can name lots of them, and it does, that's just the way it is. Uh, if you don't have strong, strong directors... Mm -hmm. And 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 <laughs> I I firmly believe that 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 um, directors probably it's all right to pay them mileage, but I don't think that they need to have a per diem. Now that's going to be argued, and that's a really a wild out statement. But when you get starting getting paid per diems. Uh, it it just changes some people, and 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 uh, I know that there's <laughs> that that's really a strange thing to say, but nonetheless, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It it can influence the decision making process. Yes, it sure, can. Yes, depending on how much it is. Yep, yeah, that's right. No, probably not so much at a local co-op level where it used to be five dollars yeah. a meeting or yeah. something. Else. Mm -hmm. As, uh, as at some of the larger yeah. facilities. Uh, so you, you obviously ha have some worry that these ethanol plants could pass out of farmer producers. Oh, ab absolutely. Because, uh, other people are going to see that there's a profit potential here and they want in. And mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, I think that that's um, really, um, well, it's taking place today. All we got to do is, is look at Verisun, yeah. And a few more of of those types of and and that's fine, but but that just tells us where it's going, and 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 uh, we as farmers have got this paradigm out there that 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 we got to go to the market. Well, I submit submit to you then, and you can cut me off if you want to, but but I submit that that our our market today is not really producing food. Our market today is going to be producing fuel and food and the fuel is is going to write the checks and the way you you collect on it is that you need to be invested in an ethanol plant. We need we we need a lot of of inter work done so that those farmers that that don't have the, the financial key, uh, uh, capability to get involved in an ethanol plant we should provide financing somehow so that if they want to be involved, they can. But we as American farmers are at a whole new threshold, I think, uh, uh, until 
such time as a fuel cell comes in or something different. But but we've got this time and frame moon window now that that we need to really be taken advantage of. And there's a lot there's a lot of us that aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, getting back toward a, a somewhat of a general cooperative question? Do you think local cooperatives are continuing to play a role in? Uh, we had a speaker at the Co-op Month Banquet this year who called the local co-op a market correcting tool as far as on the supply side anyhow, as opposed to to, to uh, uh, the new the new breed of cooperatives. Are they still doing that, or? Well, um, well, I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure we are, Chuck. I think okay. that that. Uh, uh, that without the co-op there, um, your prices. Is, is, if you if you lose that competition, why it's going to be easier to 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 increase the price. And and, and so yeah, we uh, co-ops are a sort of a price regulator to us to to a certain mm -hmm. degree. But but having said that, you still have to uh, to be with the market, of yeah. course. For a lot of the younger producers, of course, they never saw a time when there wasn't no, a co-op there. That's right. So they don't yep. really know what it would look yep. like without it. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, how important is cooperative education? You know, we've talked about loyalty and people's knowledge of, of, of the things. Do you think it's important that the uh, producers be educated uh, on, on, the, on the, uh, the, the, the positive influence in a cooperative or uh, a producer-owned facility can have? Um, yes, I do. Chuck, but I'm not sure how you uh, accomplish that. I guess that 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 we just probably keep doing it. I would, by I'm hesitant because I would like to see a better way than what we've done it in the past. But but I certainly am not smart enough to know how how mm -hmm. that is. Let me just share with you a bit that 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 uh, for example, our local local organization. Our local county farmers union. Mm -hmm. um, our Four Seasons Cooperative has always had its, over the years has always been really supportive of that organization. Mm -hmm. Yet, on that organization, mm, um, I don't know how, how I can say this. Um, I'm concerned that that that. Getting, um, trying to show that education does not all uh, always work. There are some people involved with the county organization that 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 can't support either co-op in our local community or in our county. And so our education system has missed the boat, or we we in the co-op segment have have missed it somehow when we when we as leaders can't even support, overlook the little things, and, and support our own local co-op who has been supporting the, 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 or, the organization. And, and so, so that's why I'm a little bit... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope thought. that, uh, actually, we hope that this project I'm involved in will be, a, so, will be somewhat of a new way of addressing this. Because I see. we want to make the voices of people who have been involved in the cooperative movement uh, make those available for purposes of co-op education. So okay. you and hopefully 150 or so other yeah. folks mm -hmm. uh, will, what you've had to say about co-ops and what you've thought over the years will be more available mm -hmm. to people. Um, than simply presenting some economic statistics and so on. But um, uh, do you think, uh, another another question, do you think that there's enough cooperation between cooperatives? There's always a little bit of a rivalry as your territory nut nudges into another co-ops area, but, uh, uh, and I would imagine your, your, the Four Seasons, for example, touches into uh, territory that, uh, for example, the wheat growers oh, may yes. have, or uh, or Sioux Valley over at Watertown. Uh, uh, 
do you think there's enough cooperation between those folks as opposed to the private uh, sector? Chuck, I can only speak to that in this sense, that, that, that uh, uh, in our little corner of, of northeastern South Dakota, I think that there really has been pretty fair working relationships among cooperatives. I think that, that there's a strong compet competitive edge as as it should be, I I still maintain that 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 uh, uh, that we uh, we need to have strong cooperatives to to provide competition amongst ourselves on top of everything else, because without comp without competition we get lax, and at uh, uh, and so that rivalship there is is good, but but in in our corner uh, we we we've always had a a pretty good working relationship with most of the uh, the farm supply cooperatives, mm -hmm. in, in, and we've um, worked a number of times with different co-ops and 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 tried to do things and and studied it well and and decided not to or what it never but we've always had that pretty much as far as i'm concerned open line of communication mm -hmm. uh, one issue that uh, that that uh, some of the folks have talked with me about in some of these interviews has been the the question of what is known as regionalization. I, I don't know that you've had any of it right around here, but uh, uh, it's the issue of the regional cooperative actually merging with the local cooperatives or cooperative and uh, and the local cooperative becoming a part owned by the regional, although the, with the local people having their equity in the regional but not directly in the local facility. Uh, what question are we on, Chuck? Uh, we are on question number 55. Uh, excuse me, just a um, minute. Okay. I don't think we've got that much left here. Well, uh, Chuck, I, I think that, that, that regionalization um, is at, well, I don't know, can you hear Yep, yep. Is absolutely the last underlying and score a number of times the last thing that any local farmer owned cooperative should do. But mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's that, or selling out to some private, then I guess that I can go along with with regionalization. But I well, you would much rather go with the way Four Seasons has here of absorbing some of the. Local that's a, that's that's exactly right. Um, in order to continue to have a strong federated system, you have to have people involved. And as you get into regionalizations, your voice continues to be less important. It really does. And we might not like to hear that, but that's, that's, that's what I firmly believe. And, and um, I can tell you that at that, that Four Seasons, we studied merger, uh, regionalization 
extensively. And we chose not to go that route. And there has been some directorship change on our regional board because of regionalization things and so forth. And uh, so I feel real strong about about regionalization that that it is one of those steps that that tend to lead to the to the dismantlement of the true federated system i i um, um i just can't expound on that enough i guess um uh, uh, we just look at what what history has shown us and the other thing is that I want to talk about a little bit is that, that it just doesn't seem right for me to have to, to, to um, some of the incentives that they were providing early on in, in some of those mergers came directly out of, uh, uh, out of patron equity. And so consequently, um, uh, some place that that wanted to regionalize were at a, a a financial well we're putting them putting their well how can I say it their patrons were were being financially rewarded more by regionalization than what our co-op was by staying local mm -hmm. ownership because some of our equity in our regional was transferred to help make the regionalization deal. Now, I, I'm sure you have, you've heard a lot about those types of things, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, that's the way a lot of people with my caliber of thought process, at least, goes. That's the way we have felt. Mm -hmm. I, I talked to one manager who was concerned that, uh, that he was now, uh, in, in his area at least, felt that he was competing with his own supplier and he did he kind of oh, sure. that a bit uh, yeah. because they oh, were oh, offering yeah. producers a better deal than, than he could because well that's that's a real uh, it's like a wholesaler versus a retailer now there's there's some of that goes on and 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 when that stuff really takes place it's imperative that, that those local managers inform their board of directors to what's going on and that those board of directors talk to their regional directors and not just talk to them. you you, you got to make them listen and, and, and make sure they understand what's going on. And, that, and, and that's part of our responsibility as far as, as, as local directors or even patrons of the co-op. Yeah. Because uh, I know that that go, that goes on, and in the in the or the original scheme of things, it's not supposed to. But um, somewhere down the chain chain of command, why uh, the the net return is still always important to them, and 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 sometimes they overlook those those very things that you were reading. Mm -hmm. And there, there is sometimes some confusion out there on the part of the consumer as to know whether what a, whether a particular facility is a co-op or not, because uh, there are facilities out there that are using co-op logos that aren't co-op at all. But, well, well, that's right. Oh, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're almost done here. What kind of advice would you give someone today that w was thinking about maybe as a as a producer, maybe becoming more involved in the in in any of these cooperative ventures that, that we've talked about? Certainly, you. I, I think you expressed the feeling that uh, that producers ought to, whether they have the ability or not, uh, without some assistance, uh, some loan funds, to to be involved in alternative fuels. Well. Um I don't know, Chuck, how to answer that. I guess I think that 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 if 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 you're, for example, on a farm supply co-op, if you're if you're buying product from your cooperative, that automatically puts a burden on you to to protect the dollars that you have spent there. And how do you protect protect that? Is that you become involved, and 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 stay abreast of what's 
going on and, and if you think that that you can make the co-op work a little bit better that that's great because it, we're we still are a federated system in mm -hmm. at at least in in our area we are and so and that and that chuck holds true with with electric co-ops or and it and even ethanol producing co-ops and 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 uh, again it's a way to a to extend yourself and 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 uh, uh, reap some of the benefits that are out there, some of them might not be uh, amount to anything except that that it's providing the service for you. But on the other hand, such as the ethanol place or no, ethanol plants, there that's going to be a, a market for you, where you're going to get your payback from. Mm -hmm. Are you? Would you describe yourself as optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I think you sound, you're sounding a little optimistic, but uh, as about the future yeah. for, uh, for cooperatives, you, you, yeah, yeah. You, you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, um, no, I think I think um, uh, that that I I um, that's my nature to to remain optimistic. I mm -hmm. think, but but I I really believe that that uh, that. We are on a threshold of 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 um, of new new things for the 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 American farmer, and I think that that that, that our far, our farm organizations need to play a little greater role in 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 helping that come true. Because uh, in order in order to do that, some of these farmers need to have some money. Made, uh, uh, made available to them somehow, to 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 in, invest in these plants and to make sure that those plants are run right. And and there's lots of things that can help can happen to the ethanol industry, of course. But but if you if you stay involved and 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 uh, that's the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. If that makes any sense to you. Do you have any anything else you'd like to add that we haven't talked about? Um, I'm not sure that I, that I I really do, Chuck. Um, okay. um, I think that that um, that we really have been fortunate over the years. That 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 we have had all of our different co farm cooperatives, and um, it would be uh, uh, I, I well I need to thank all of those pioneering people that that took the time to to set up the structure, and and uh, um, that's uh, another reason I think that I became involved was to help protect that. Structure and 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 uh, I would hope that that we're able to to uh, as long as there are family farmers on the land, why well, I hope that we would be able to can continue down that road. Okay. Um, I don't know really anything else, Chuck. Uh, um, have you got any? No, I don't. We've been visiting with Owen Jones. Thank you for participating in the Cooperative Legacy Project.